Mazimbabwean President Robert Mugabe died in a Singapore hospital on the 6th of September last year at the age of 95. Arguably one of the most controversial African leaders, Mugabe died two years after he was toppled in a 2017 coup and after 37 years in power. How has Zimbabwe been faring one year after his death? We'll look at how the country is doing and what kind of legacy its former President Robert Mugabe left. Joining me is Patrick Joao, the late Robert Mugabe's nephew who also served in the former president's cabinet. Good to have you with us. A day before, um, you know, the family, of course, is to reflect and think back to last year, this, you know, um, on the 6th of September. Really a difficult day when he passed on and, and, I mean, seeing scenes from some of the family members were really heartbroken. How has it been a year on? It's, it's been a difficult time, and uh, thank you very much for giving us uh, this opportunity as a family. Uh, to thank uh, everybody that uh, was with us during this very, very difficult period that we experienced. But it's been uh, really, really, really sad. Uh, sad in that uh, what President Mugabe foresaw as a result of the coup in 2017 is now unfolding and is unfolding at a dramatic pace at a pace that is really very, very frightening. And I, I, I remember we had a conversation during the coup and I was trying to teach you a Shona word. I think I tried to teach you uh, the word kunyepa mm. and I tried to teach mm. a colleague of yours from another agency the word kuitiswa. And uh, I, I now know that you do understand those words. You do understand that the world was sold a dummy by Emerson Munangagwa. Some of us that worked with Emerson Munangagwa knew the level or lack of capacity that he had. We knew how vindictive a person he is, and we knew that he could not be able to take the country forward. So what we now have right now in Zimbabwe uh, are so many episodes of crises, but the biggest of those crises is the way in which the Zimbabwean people have been denied their right to be represented by the people that they want. And I'll give three specific examples. There was a, during 2018, uh, during the parliamentary election for Chegutu West constituency, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission deliberately falsified the results. That case was taken to court. They, uh, the, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission appointed Dexter Nduna as a member of parliament. Mm -hmm. The court accepted that the results were falsified, but to date, Dexter Nduna is still a member of parliament. And uh, last year, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission submitted its re a report on the conduct of the presidential elections. And in that report, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission admitted that it broke the electoral law. And uh, provided a basis for which the presidential elections could be manipulated, the results were manipulated. To date, we still have that. And what is even becoming worse now is that we have a, we have a captured judiciary that has now put in place a leadership for the main opposition party, which was not elected by opposition supporters. And that leadership is systematically recalling people that were elected into parliament, out of parliament, and replacing them with proxies. So if you're a Zimbabwean and you voted uh, for a member of parliament, it is not that member of parliament that is representing you. If you're a Zimbabwean and you voted for a president, it is not that president that is representing you. But some are saying that uh, what uh, the current president is doing is really a continuation of, of what was happening you, before. But that is that those that are saying that are idiots and nincompoops because you really cannot be talking about something that happened before and use that as a basis for a continued injustice. So what you're saying is that under your uncle there was injustice in Zimbabwe? I'm, no, 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 no. I'm not saying that. What I am saying that is that line of thinking is flawed. But why would it be flawed? Because some are saying that but, the but, current but, but, but really president was, in the, but, was, was but there at, at as the, the right At the moment, man. President Mugabe is uh, lying in his grave in his village. And he has no capacity to be able to do anything to change the objective reality of Zimbabweans. And therefore, 
having a conversation around President Mugabe is a futile exercise. But why? Let's, let's, have, a, let's, have, let's, have, a, let's have a conversation right now. Mm around the democratic uh, representation of people that has been denied. And then, once we've corrected that, then we can have the luxury of going back. But in the meanwhile, having a conversation to say that, oh, by the way, I didn't eat three days ago. So let's talk about the fact that I didn't eat three days ago whilst you are hungry today. That doesn't make sense. But you have to let's, talk about the fact that you let's, didn't let's, eat let's, three days let's, ago let's, because you'd still be hungry. And let's, I'm going let's, to ask us to pause there just for a still, second, Patrick. Let, just just for a second. The, we have to go am, for a quick at, at break. At the moment I'm thirsty, so I'm going to take a drink of water. <laughs> please drink your water. And do not think about the fact that I was thirsty two yes, days ago. Yes, please drink, drink your water while we pause. We're going to continue with this discussion after the break because we do have to go back. Unfortunately, we do have to look back because that's what legacy is about, is what you leave behind. We continue our discussion with Patrick Shuao after this. Thanks for staying with us. We continue our conversation with Patrick Shuao, who's the nephew of former uh, late Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe. We were still talking about uh, looking back and the legacy because there's no way that we could be here without looking at how we got here. Yes. So certainly it is something that is of value to look back. And, and I'm still asking you the question that some were saying that um, the current president, Emerson Mnangagwa, was obviously the guy that was executing every single thing for the former president but also others are saying that he's carrying forward what has been put in place by the political party that is in power and also the former late president what do you say to that because we certainly cannot ignore the history of zimbabwe i, I think I, I i must admit that it would be disingenuous for me to turn around and say that uh, president robert mugabe was a saint he was a human being uh, there are certain things that he definitely did not do as well as he should, but there are certain things that he did well. Now, I am his nephew, and my focus is on looking at his legacy and the positive legacy of what he did. And, and, and let, let me explain it from my own personal perspective in terms of what I am doing and how I believe that over the next 30 to 40 years of my life, I'm going to be building onto the legacy of President Robert Mugabe. One of the things that President Robert Mugabe believed in strongly was the ability of agriculture to be a transformative industry. And this is one of the reasons why, uh, why, why he, he strongly supported the land reform program, apart from uh, correcting the injustices of, of colonialism. I, I remember after I left university, armed with a degree in computer engineering and a master's in business administration, he would talk to me and he would say to me that I must uh, become a farmer. I would, I would look at this old man and I'd laugh to myself and say, you know, this old man is mad. I'm an educated, tech-savvy young man. I'm not going to go into agriculture. But the time that I then got into agriculture, I realized how wise he was. Agriculture provided me with a capacity and an ability to be able to move my life forward. But I also noticed quite significantly people that uh, 
were part of those that invaded uh, f f uh, land with literally nothing. I noticed their livelihoods changing. Now, what can I do about that? Uh, I can no longer farm in Zimbabwe as effectively as I used to be able to farm. But at least President Mugabe uh, gave me the ability to be an academic. So I am going to be going forward, researching into making sure that as a, as a continent, as Africa, how do we then try get Africa to go through the same type of industrial agricultural revolution that the British went through in the 17th century, the same type of green revolution that the, that the East Asian tigers went through the same in, in the 1960s, the same type of agricultural revolution that China went through in the 70s and 80s as the basis for a more sustainable uh, growth. And this is what I'm doing. I'm doing that from an academic point of view in terms of the research, and I'm doing that from a knowledge uh, dissemination point of view in terms of the teaching that I'm doing at um, You say that he was human, and there are certainly things that he did not do right. What are those? I, I, oh, I will now let his detractors talk about But those. what are those? I, you are his I, I, nephew, I, you were in his well, what, 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 the, the biggest one, his biggest in, uh, failing in my view, was uh, that he did not manage to contain Emerson Monangagwa as effectively as we were at trying to ask him to do. Be he knew the character of Emerson Monangagwa, but he really tried to mold him, and he really had faith in, uh, his, in, in, in some form of humanity that could be found within Emerson Monangagwa. But I think he, he placed too much faith in, in, in the wrong person. And I think if he should never have appointed Emerson Munangago vice president in 2015, and, and when he appointed him vice president in 2015, I, 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 I took a back seat because I was convinced that Emerson Munangago is the worst thing that could happen to Zimbabwe. You say um, you were asking, you and some others were asking him to contain Emerson and Nagako. What would that containment, uh, would have, what would it have looked like then? The, the first one, the first bit that we were basically were looking at was uh, to get some of our um, heavily traumatized liberation fighters to recognize that Zimbabwe is for all Zimbabweans uh, what Emerson Munangagwa and his ilk believe is that because they fought during the liberation struggle, they believe that they are stockholders, they are the stockholders of Zimbabwe, and every other Zimbabwean is a stakeholder. Now, that's a very, very dangerous narrative. And it is, this, is, this is the same narrative that is now informing their approach to governance. And, the, and, and unfortunately, a significant number of Emerson Munangagwa's court is made up of people that are intellectually challenged, people that really don't know how to think, and, but they still hold this entitlement that they are st stockholders of Zimbabwe. So that stockholder mentality is unfortunately uh, what we hope that uh, the delegations that will be coming from the ANC going to ZANU-PF will be able to tell those comrades that, hey, 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 hey comrades, you are lost. So some are saying that, uh, I mean, you, 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 you criticizing uh, Zimbabwe and, and, and some of those that have I'm come out I'm not criticizing say, Zimbabwe. I'm criticizing, I'm criticizing the, 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 current the clueless uh, leadership that is currently in Zimbabwe. Okay. Let's look at the current uh, leadership and as you are, of course, uh, picking all those faults and, and, and even as we discussed that this is, you know, in, in, an argument can be raised here to say that this is a legacy that they inherited. But when you look at r your role, you were in cabinet and right now... I was in was, cabinet for two years. Yes. And I was in there. cabinet for two years. Mm. Emerson Munangagwa was in cabinet parliament for 40 years. But you now, were still you can, you part cannot, of the and, uh, No, now this is, you see... And he was still your such, nephew. This is such he was still false, your uncle, I mean. This is such false equivalence. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I was in cabinet for two years and that Emerson Munangago was, been, was, was, with, was in cabinet for 40 years meant that the voice that I had with President Mugabe 
was a significant fraction of the voice that Emma Sumunangagwa and his ilk had. And, and I think that is, that is really quite critical. Mm. Uh, and I think you can't uh, fault him, you can't fault President Mugabe for, for having a little bit of faith in some of the colleagues that he had been with from the 1960s, some of them that he had been with even before some of us were born. But you do admit that um, President Emerson Mnangagwa did not inherit a Zimbabwe that was doing well. No, Zimbabwe is not, uh, is not an inheritance. But I'm yet. just saying, it, when you look at him de right de now de in definitely. power... We, we, we had, we had, we've, we've had significant challenges as Zimbabwe uh, since uh, the year 2000 quite true we've had significant challenges uh, i must admit that i was part of the policy making mechanism uh, policy making framework within within zanu pf and i remember some of the initiatives that we put forward we were, we were very very difficult to be able to push forward for example uh, how do we manage land how do we manage the allocation of land i held the view and i remember talking to the, who was the to a colleague in cabinet who was a minister of, uh, of land and rural resettlement then saying what we should have is that people that have got bigger tracts of land should actually pay a rental for that land which is higher. And he came back to me and he says, Patrick, the guys that have got bigger tracts of land are the generals and they will never agree to something like that. So it was quite difficult. It was a very, very difficult uh, uh, situation to navigate. And this is why some of these people don't really want to talk to us. They, this is why they shot at us. Because you, they knew we, we, we had other, uh, 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 other perspectives. I also remember uh, trying to explain to General Chuenga mm -hmm. uh, when he was trying to get me to support Emerson Monangagwa to be president. And I said to General Chuenga, no, General, this man is unelectable. He does not have the capacity to deal with people. He does not have the intellect to be able to lead the country. And the general said, okay, fine, we'll see what we can do. And they recognized that Emerson Mnangago was unelectable. But because of their entitlement mantra, they decided that the elections uh, are, are, are not necessary. And we can see that with the examples that I gave you. We can see that without the, the, the democratic process has been is now being, uh, being undermined quite significantly. Are you, are you, are you um, maybe uh, one would say and, and ask you this, are you bitter because you're not part of the apparent gravy train right Goodness now? Goodness gracious me, I am absolutely enjoying lecturing at WITS. I'm absolutely enjoying uh, supervising my, uh, my MBA students. I'm absolutely enjoying watching and actually realizing that, oh my God, I managed to dodge a bullet. I'm not part of that regime. Let's talk about what is happening right now, the arrest of Hopal Chinono, a journalist who has really been uh, doing quite a lot of work when it comes to investigative journalism, and he was given bail quite recently. What do you make of that? I, I, I think uh, Hopal is a celebrity journalist, but I think the story that I really think we want to talk about is the story of Tawanda Mchehiwa. Uh, Tawanda is a nephew to, to Mdudu Zumatutu, the editor of Zim Life. And Mdudu Zumatutu is the one who broke the story that Hopewell uh, also publicized. And Mdudu is still in hiding. Now, when they couldn't find Mdudu, what, guess what they did? They abducted his three nephews. They, abduct, they abducted his sister. Now, this is what is happening. You've got journalists that are living in fear. Not only do you have journalists that are living in fear, but you have the deputy chief secretary to the president and cabinet going out of his way to abuse one of uh, South Africa's leading journalists. Yes, she comes from the SABC, Sophie Mokwena. For the past two days, George Charamba has been abusing Sophie Mokwena. And the reason he's abusing it on a public platform like Twitter is to send a message to all the other journalists that are in Zimbabwe to say, look, if this is what we as a regime can do to Sophie Mokwena, the SABC editor for Africa, 
anybody, any other journalist who is in Zimbabwe, you better keep quiet. Otherwise, you're going to go through worse than what Hopewell has gone through. You're going to, your relatives are going to go through worse than what uh, Tawanda Mchehia has gone through. But it's not new. We, we, we saw reports of uh, journalists not being able to do their work in an effective way while your uncle was in power. But you, nev you, nev you never saw relatives of journalists. But there were even reports and rumors yeah. suggesting abductions were also taking place. Are you so, saying those are false? Are you saying that right now, so, under uh, so, the late so, so, Robert so now that, so, now, so now that you say it's not new. What, what's, what's the next way forward? So the, the fact that it, your, your observation that it is not new means that it must continue? But are we surprised by it? We must be surprised by it because it, it is continuing. It must surprise us. And how do, how, how how, then how do the, Zimbabweans stop it? Zimbabweans don't have the capacity to stop it because Zimbabwe currently is under a military regime. And guess why it is under a military regime? It's because you, as members of the media, when the coup was, hap was happening, you chose not to describe it as a coup. So, the media is also complicit. Whilst I must take ownership for having failed to make certain changes, I believe you as a media and everybody else that supported the coup must also take ownership for having supported uh, Zimbabwe going in the, in, in, in the, in, in the wrong direction. W so how do we move forward? I wish we had how more time because then I would like to uh, unpack what you're saying about how, 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 do we, how, do we move, how do we move forward? The way in which we can move forward is to be able to address the current challenges that are there. And the biggest challenge that is there is that Zimbabwe is no longer being governed by a liberation movement. It is now being governed by a vampire state, by a vampire entity that has taken over what used to be the liberation movement called ZANU-PF. And who are the best people to be able to look at that? The best people to be able to look at that is Africa's oldest liberation movement. And my appeal to colleagues who are in the leadership of the ANC is that they really need to be able to look at the facts as they are. I know a significant number of them. I, I remember having a conversation a couple of days ago uh, where, uh, where, I was, where I was trying to explain the challenges that are happening in Zimbabwe. And one of the senior uh, ANC leaders said, oh, but this used to happen in, 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 during Robert Mugabe's time. But Robert Mugabe is dead. He is dead. But he died a year ago. I wish and, we had more and, time. And, and you know, you can't then turn around and say, but Robert Mugabe is not there. That is stupid.